back in 2001, I was employed as the vice president of a tech company, which I found with two other business partners. We weathered the dot com bubble but had to let go of many talented employees. For a while there, it seemed like we might survive. But then you all know what happened in September of 2001. That major event accelerated the stock market crash and we had to file for bankruptcy soon after. By 2002, people with my talents were dime a dozen, and getting a job in my field was close to impossible. My wife and I sold our house, then moved into a condo. We transferred our children from a $50,000 per year private school to a public one. I believe the last downsizing we did was to sell our two luxury cars and purchase a Toyota Camry for my wife. I, on the other hand, began using public transportation. So we made all the right moves after the business went belly up. We didn't wait until we emptied our bank account and maxed out our credit cards, but instead we made swift and sound financial decisions to adapt to our new reality. With the additional money that we had after selling every luxury item in our possession, my wife and children were going to be taken care of for the next 10 years, even if I didn't make a dime. I had my family in a good spot, and now I had to look for a job outside of my field. I searched for everything from government jobs to teaching, but for one, jobs were hard to come by, and two, all of them paid like crap. Then, about a month into the job search, a close friend of mine called and said he had a job opportunity for me. The job description didn't sound enticing at all. But I liked the fact that the offer was so clearly laid out. The position was a security guard, and the individual who was hiring me wanted me to watch over an old building he owns. The building's nearly 80 years old, and it comes with quite the history. Long story short, think murder, kidnap, and torture. The building's enormous. It was originally built as a mansion for some rich family. That family sold the mansion to a corporation when all five of their children died due to illness and accidents in that mansion. The corporation turned it into a private school, but then it had to shut it down after several questionable deaths by both the faculty and students. It was kept empty for the last 30 years, and the new owner had purchased it only recently. Many teenagers in that town would trespass into the building to do drugs and whatnot, and that's the reason why he needed a security guard. However, he had a problem. Nobody in that town wanted the job. He offered up to $60,000 per year to look after an empty building, but nobody even showed up for an interview. So, in the end, my friend knew I was looking for a job. He knew the owner of the building because he worked as his attorney, and he felt both of our needs would be met if I took the job, so I did. I understood from day one why no one wanted the job. The only clean part of the building was the room I was staying in. They installed a small kitchen, put a new coat of paint, redid the floor, and such. As far as my room was concerned, it was good. You would hear all kinds of things at night, and it was just terrible. Cats going nuts, raccoons coming in and out, windows shaking to the gust of wind, old wooden floor creaking, pipes bending due to temperature changes, and the occasional teens who would sneak in and trick me into believing a freaking ghost was running amok. Learning all these things, adjusting to this horrible place and living there, It was not easy. I settled in pretty well after two months of stay there. As much as the place scared me at times, what was even more scary was the thought of not being able to provide for my family. I felt lucky in a way, and I was fine with the arrangement. So I remember it as my first week of my third month of stay there. I was doing my final patrol at 10 pm and heard someone getting hit in the west wing area of the building. I slowly walked toward the source of the sound, and when I'm close enough, 
I could tell the person crying is a woman and the person doing the hitting is a man. I take my big ass flashlight out, which was the only thing close to a weapon I was allowed to carry, and run into the room where the sound was coming from. Every part of the building had lights, although the bulbs being used were only 60 watts and therefore not so bright. I could turn on the lights from a central area and so every corner of the building was illuminated to a degree during my patrol. The first thing I see when I enter the room is a gigantic machete. Okay, pause. It was a normal sized machete, but it looked huge in that moment. Okay, continue story. I was scared and so I uttered something stupid. Hey, you're not supposed to be here. But before I could even finish what I'm saying, the guy's already charging at me with the gigantic machete raised up high. I back away as quickly as I can, but I don't turn my back on him because I fear that he'll throw the machete at my back and I wouldn't see it coming. At least if I face him, I've got a chance to dodge it. We are in the hallway and the machete man slows down. I continue backing away but then I also know there's a door I need to open before I can continue into the next section of the hallway. Knowing that, I throw the flashlight aiming at the machete man's face and it lands squarely on his nose. The pain throws him up for a second and I make a run for it. I go out of the building and could see that the girl who was getting hit in the room is well ahead of me. I could keep two shifts right now because my destination is the gas station nearby. Five minutes later, I'm at the gas station, call the cops from there, and of course when the cops go to the mansion, the machete man has already left the premises. That incident ended as such, the cops made additional patrols near the mansion for the next couple of weeks and everything went back to normal after that. By the way, if you are curious about the girl, she's never been found after that. I'm guessing she ran away safely because she had a huge head start on me. But she's a bitch, I practically saved her life, but the ungrateful piece of shit didn't call the cops for me. A few months go by after the incident and I'm now a total boss of that place. I can identify every little noise, I knew every section of the building and felt extremely comfortable there. So one night, I finish my patrol and go to my room for a well-deserved slumber. I turn off the light, hit the sack, but I'm unable to fall asleep for the next two hours. It's already midnight and I'm wide awake even though I'm tired as hell. Then without a warning, someone slowly opens the door to my room. I swear to god, I didn't hear anyone walking nearby and I'm usually really good at picking up noises. It's pitch black in the room, I hear the footsteps closing in on me, and I'm thinking what I should do next. I bought a hunting knife and a pepper spray after the last incident. I used to keep them near the bed, but began misplacing them after a while. Right now, I've got no idea where I've placed them. During the time all these useless thoughts went through my mind, the mystery person had already come close enough to see me eye to eye. I look at him and he looks at me. We both know we can see each other and I'm thinking that's probably due to the moonlight. I can see his freakishly white eyes. He tries to strike me with something and I've got just enough time to move my body slightly toward the bottom end of the bed. I get up, hear something hitting the bed, then run out the door no shoes and all. The fucker chases after and I run as fast as I can. I feel the tiny pebbles stab my feet and every time it's extremely painful. I then feel something hit my back and whatever that's hit me falls on the floor making a metallic noise. It hurts like a bitch but seeing as I'm still running, it looks as though I'm still alive. I run my ass to the gas station again, then do the same things I did the last time. However, before the cops arrived, the gas station clerk told me I was bleeding from my back. I took off my shirt and asked him to check the wound for me. He said it looked like the sharp end of a knife had been stuck in there and then pulled out. 
right there and then, I had a suspicious feeling that tonight's attacker was the machete man a few months back. But anyhow, the cops came, I was taken to the hospital, got 12 stitches and that was that. Now, after nearly getting killed twice in the same building, you might think I quit right away, but I didn't. I couldn't find another job that paid as much, and so I wasn't about to let a machete wielding psycho stop me from feeding my family. I got a handgun after that, yeah the permit, the training and all. The building owner couldn't say shit because he had no one else to replace me. I didn't tell my wife about the attacks until I quit the job after 3 years. That was a good thing because it made her really sad and I don't like her seeing sad. One thing that I do want to mention about the last incident is what the police have found in my room. Right around the area where the assailant has struck the bed with his machete, a good chunk of hair was found neatly sliced like I had been given a haircut. My hair was kind of long at the time and so when I pushed myself down toward the bottom of the bed, it was hanging where my forehead was supposed to be. The machete cleanly sliced through the hair but that actually could have been the top of my head. I don't know how strong human skulls are, but there's a possibility that the assailant could have opened the top of my skull like a freaking lid. But that's all in the past and I'm now doing much better both financially and job wise. It was quite a ride for me for those 3 years. I hope you've enjoyed my story Dennis, I think it's good enough for your channel, so thanks for reading and goodbye. A long time ago when I was much younger, I used to work as a security guard for a big city hospital. I can't be sure but I believe I was 22 when I first began working there and I quit when I was 26. When you first work at a hospital, you tend to see many strange things that aren't actually there. Hospitals don't really make the most pleasant work environment and therefore it's easy to be scared into imagining some wild things. Working as a security guard, you get plenty of opportunities to get lost in the huge building that the city hospitals usually are. During the first 3 months, I think I spent just as much time getting lost in the myriad of hallways than actually doing my job. I've had many strange things happen to me, including some things that had perfectly reasonable explanation and some that didn't. I'll speak a few of them here. One day, I was making my normal run starting in the basement, we have a ton of unused medical equipment, furniture, backup generator and the morgue there as well. I was passing by the morgue and I made sure to stick to the right side of the hallway because to be truthful here, that room scared the bejesus out of me. That's when I heard someone fart in the morgue and I'll be honest, I nearly peed myself. But this is a job and I don't want to get fired. I had to find the source of the noise. I walk into the morgue, turn on the light, but there's no one in there. I wanted to check the entire room and so I walked forward a few steps when I heard another fart. It startled me so much that I tripped on myself and fell flat on the floor. However, the fault did knock some sense into me and I realized how foolishly I was acting. What the hell was I thinking that it could be a ghost? I felt embarrassed for myself so I finished checking the room and got out without further incident. Later that day, I got a hold of a doctor and asked if corpses could make noises. The doctor asked to describe the noise and I told him that it sounded like farting. He gave me the answer. As the body decomposes, gas can build up inside and then be discharged at random intervals. The corpse could also have air in the lungs and that could also make strange noises. It doesn't happen all the time and it's kinda rare but the point is, there are scientific explanations for how a human body could make noises post-mortem. Another story that's kinda of related to the fart noise is this one time when I heard a corpse speak. Tom, I think he was a nurse assistant at the time and he was escorting a deceased down the morgue. 
Well, I just happen to be in the middle of my patrol in the basement when I see Tom pushing the gurney at nearly running speed, stops right next to me and says, I really need to go take a dump, please watch the body for me. He ran away before I could say anything back and I was stuck with the body. I was pacing back and forth when I swear I heard the body go. Ah, <sighs> what the hell I thought. It sounded exactly like a person exhaling. And then again. Ah, uh, which prompted me to slowly back away from the body. I put about 10-15 steps between me and the body, kept my eyes fixated on it so I could run like the wind if it got up and then Tom arrived. That's when I learned from him that at times corpses do expel air from their lungs and so their talents weren't only in farting. Tom told me that I handled it like a champ and that he screamed like a girl the first time he heard a corpse sigh. I don't know if he was just being nice, but I did feel better. Now I'll tell you of a story which no one's really been able to explain with rational scientific reasoning. There was this patient in a vegetated state who, according to the nurses, has been kept alive by the machines for nearly 5 years. When I had night shifts, I would often see the door to his room open and the reasoning behind it was the request from the family. They were paying a lot of money to the hospital to keep him alive. There were certain conditions that had to be met and one of them was keeping the door open at nights and allowing the patient to listen to the noises from the outside such as people walking, talking and everything else. At first, I didn't even go near the room, but I got curious as the days passed and one day I entered this room. I checked him out, walked around the room a little, because it's just the sort of thing you do when you get bored. I was about to walk out of the room when the man turned his head in my direction and pushed it up at about 30 degree angle. He kept that position for about 5 seconds and looked directly into my eyes. Then flat, just like that, he went back to the vegetative state again. I ran out the room and went straight to the nurses. The doctor came and I explained to him what I had seen. He told me that the movement was reflexive and that the eyes do sometimes follow moving objects. However, he told me that the patient couldn't have pushed his head up as high as 30 degrees because of muscle atrophy. It had already been 5 years since the patient's been bedridden and there was no way that it could make those kinds of sudden movements in such degree of difficulty. I didn't argue but it was wrong. When I said 30 degrees, I was being conservative with my estimates. The truth was, it was at least 30 degrees and not about 30 degrees. The patient also moved as quickly as a healthy person would when fully awake and not as someone would after a 5 year nap. For God's sake, I moved like a worm right after waking up from an overnight slumber. How do you explain the patient's cat-like reflexes? In any event, that was that and I never went back to the patient's room again. Not only because it was spooky, but mainly because I didn't want to get fired. I'll finish the story off with one of the scariest and saddest experiences I had at the hospital. I'm normally not assigned for patrolling the children's ward, but every once in a while, something comes up and I have to cover that area as well. There was this one kid named Patrick and sadly he had leukemia. He was staying at the hospital full time and for the most part, his mom was always there with him. Patrick was loved by everyone in the hospital because of how polite, warm and smart he was. So whenever I had the chance to go to the children's ward, I would buy a chocolate bar from the vending machine and give it to Patrick as I passed his room. Please don't worry, a chocolate bar every few days was allowed by the doctors. I would never give a patient something to eat without getting permission from their physicians. I got to know Patrick little by little because I would go visit him even on days I didn't have to be at the children's ward. I've learned that he was 9 years old, he loves to read about science, he badly wished to go back to school and he wanted to become a commercial jet pilot when he grew up. Patrick left the hospital after 4 weeks of chemotherapy and I was really happy for him that he got to go back home. I just assumed that he went home because he got better 
and I figured I would never see him again, which was a good thing. Then a few months thereafter, I learned that Patrick was hospitalized again. Unfortunately, he didn't come back for a checkup or additional rounds of chemotherapy. He had come to the hospital to die. The parents chose the hospital as his final resting place because the medical staff would ensure Patrick's final days are comfortable. Well, as comfortable as death can be, I suppose. But yeah, two days after he had been hospitalized, I was on a night shift doing my regular patrol and had this sudden craving for a cigarette. There's a spot around the corner of the hospital building where I normally take my smoke breaks and so I headed toward the front entrance. The lobby that leads to the entrance is tall and expansive. It almost feels like you're in a grand church. I must have been about 30 yards from the rotating door when I saw Patrick running toward a man. The time was 3 a.m. Patrick shouldn't be able to run in his condition. The man he was running to wasn't his father, and so everything about it looked wrong. I ran after Patrick, but the man had already gotten hold of him, and he ran out the building with Patrick in his arms. I wasn't too far behind. At most, I was trailing him by about 20 yards. I'm outside of the building, no more than 3 seconds after the man went out, but I saw no one near the entrance or the entire building for that matter. I yelled, Patrick, Patrick, and that's when I heard someone calling my name, Travis, wake up dude. Well, apparently, I fell asleep during my smoke break and it was Dr. Lee who was waking me up. We had a chuckle, Dr. Lee lit a cigarette, and I went back inside the hospital. The first thing I did was to go to the floor where Patrick's room is located because that's what people do after a peculiar dream. You dream of being bitten in half by a shark, then you look down to see that your legs are still attached to your body. Or if you dreamt of having sex, then you look down as well to check that you haven't made a mess down there. So yeah, I wanted to go check on Patrick, not as in go to his room and ask if he's okay, but I just wanted to be on that floor and make sure all was fine. As soon as the elevator door opened, I could hear something bad was happening. I heard someone shouting, some running, but most of all, I could hear a woman and a man crying in the background. They were Patrick's parents, and he had just died. I remember going right back inside the elevator because I didn't want to disturb anyone. I pressed the button for the ground floor, and as I leaned forward, I see a tiny drop of clear liquid spilled on the floor. I was crying, but I didn't even know it. It was the first time I had seen a child die, and it was so hard to stomach. He was just 9 years old, barely began his life, and had so much to look forward to. I went to a spot in the hospital where people normally don't come. I sat in the corner and cried for like half an hour. I still get sad thinking about that night, but the experience also brings back the fear I felt when I saw that mysterious man carry Patrick away in my dream. The timing was too impeccable for me to dismiss it as a coincidence. I dream of Patrick being taken away from the hospital and as I was seeing that unfold in my dream, Patrick had died in the real world. If that doesn't make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, then I don't know what would. I think I should wrap up this message for the time being, but just so you know, there's a lot more of where they came from. Let me know if you want to hear more and I'll send them to you. I look forward to our Skype chat, Dennis. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, it saddens me to say this, but I believe you might be witnessing the final few months of channels like mine on YouTube, especially the small ones that do invest heavily in production value. If you're not aware of the current situation with YouTube, the gist of it is that the Wall Street Journal has published a questionable article with another one of their social justice agenda, and that has forced 250 major corporations to pull their ads from YouTube. This in turn has resulted in the decrease of about 80% of ad revenue earnings for most YouTubers. My channel is actually doing worse and that's probably due to the fact that it deals with edgier contents and YouTube is likely being extra careful placing high paying ads on such videos. 
To give you an example, 105 out of the 112 videos on my channel have been age restricted by April 14, 2017, which is the day I'm making this recording. Content like that don't receive high paying ads, that's how things work right now. This of course is just another dime a dozen case of these social justice warriors desperately trying to find excuses to get mad at people and also ruin their lives. You see, I, I don't depend on YouTube income to make a living, but hundreds of other talented and passionate creators do. Just imagine what this is doing to their livelihood, the families that depend on their income, and of course how it'll affect you, the viewers. For example, I'm currently sitting on a ton of new materials, thanks to the three people whom I've hired to help me with the videos. One of them finds European stories, one translates Asian stories, and the last individual edits and cleans up the narration. I could have been publishing a ton of stories in the last two weeks, but I'm perplexed at how to make the content so that they are genuine but at the same time wouldn't trigger the YouTube algorithm to punish them for being advertiser unfriendly. The thing is, I was actually pumping in more money into this channel than I was earning even before hiring the three helpers. But I made the hire anyway because for one, I've got a full time job and a life but also because I wanted to publish more stories for you guys. The last 10 days or so, uh, I've been pondering on what I should do going forward. I can't reveal the exact sum, but my channel <laughs> currently as it stands, it, it is earning cents. Not dollars, cents. I had to let go of the photo guy because of other reasons, but for now, I'm going to retain the services of the other three helpers. If I go out, I <laughs> I'd rather go out with a bang for you guys. But since I want to remain on this platform and since I don't think channels like mine would ever go back to receiving those lucrative ads, I thought about finding other means to supplement the expenditure incurred in operating a channel like mine. Many of you have suggested for me to open a Patreon account in the past, but I never went ahead with that because all I wanted was to make videos. I didn't care that I had to pay from my own pocket for the little extra expenditure and the last thing I wanted was to ask you, ask you guys to foot the bill. But now, I make cents, pennies. <laughs> I make a tiny percentage of what this channel used to generate. It is of course unsustainable. What I'll do is this, I'll continue using the services of the three helpers and publish as many videos as I possibly can in the next two months. If things do improve within that time, then of course I'll be, it'll be business as usual. But if things stay the same, then I'll be forced to let go of the three helpers and go back to the old upload schedule which was like one video every two weeks or 10 days or so sometimes. I'm going to be making a second channel and for that channel I'll be making contents that deal with science, uh, paranormal stuff, interesting current events and just do things that I find interesting. I hope I'm wrong, but my belief is that uh, this channel will be uh, brought to its knees at some point and since my passion is making videos, the new channel will serve as my outlet to bring you guys new contents. And that's about it folks, I uh, apologize for the long absence but I needed the time to think over the current situation. Have a wonderful weekend everyone and I'll talk to you on the next one. Goodbye.